Okay, I think we're going to get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Data Science for the Public Good Distinguished Speaker Series and Forum. I'm very excited today that we have Hadley Wickham with us, and um, I will introduce him in just a minute. You know, for newcomers to our forum, I wanted to share that I'm Sally Keller. I am a distinguished professor in the Biocomplexity Institute here at University of Virginia. And I lead a social and decision analytics division, and we are um, heavy users of all of the wonderful things that Hadley's going to talk about today. The forum itself is a partnership between the Biocomplexity Institute, our, our Darden School of Business at University of Virginia, and also the Democracy Initiatives Equity Center. And all of us um, in this partnership welcome all of you here today. And in particular, we'd like to thank our sponsors for the forum, which includes Avis and Young, the Washington Statistical Society, NORC at the University of Chicago, the American Statistical Association, Sage Publishing, Westat, and our studio, who's been one of our supporters from the start. We really appreciate all of their support, and we also appreciate your support in joining us in joining in the conversation that brings together public and private stakeholders to discuss doing data science, and particularly with a focus on evidence-based policymaking and in innovation to enhance the quality of our lives wherever we live, learn, work, and play. I just have one little bit of housekeeping, and that's how you can ask questions today. The best way to ask questions is to use the Q&A button, which on my screen, it's at the bottom of the screen. It may be someplace else on your screens, but look for the Q&A button. And if you click that, you can enter your question and we will then be able to ask those questions. Um, at the end of the talk, for sure, if there's some question that you have, burning question for clarification, put it in there and I will see about interrupting Hadley if it's appropriate. So let me take a couple minutes to introduce Hadley. So Hadley is a statistician and he's also the chief scientist at our studio. Hadley spends his time building tools that are both computational and cognitive in nature. And they're designed to make data science easier, faster, and more fun, which is a hallmark of everything I've ever seen Hadley do. He's also an adjunct professor at three world-renowned universities, University of Auckland, Stanford University, and Rice University. And I have to share that I had the delight of helping to hire Hadley into the statistics department at Rice University for his first position following graduate school while I was Dean of Engineering there. And I have thoroughly enjoyed watching his career unfold ever since. Hadley received a Bachelor's of Human Biology and a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Statistics at the University of Auckland, and then went on to Iowa State to complete his PhD in Statistics. During his graduate studies, he was awarded the John Chambers Award for Statistical Computing for his work developing tools for data reshaping and visualization. This is an incredibly fitting award for Hadley First of all, it's an incredibly prestigious award for any junior scholar to get during their graduate studies, but particularly for Hadley, as John Chambers was one of the primary developers for S, which later morphed into S plus and now into R, and now into R Studio. In 2005, Hadley was named a fellow of the American Statistical Association for pivotal contributions to statistical practice through innovation and pioneering research in statistical graphics and computing. And then in 2019, Hadley was awarded the International COPS President's Award, which is one of the most prestigious awards given out in statistics annually to a young statistician in recognition of outstanding contribution to the profession of statistics through their research. So with that background, I am gonna turn it over to you, Hadley. Thanks, Ellie. And thanks for that uh, lovely introduction. So today I'm going to talk about uh, the dplyr package and in particular one of the things that I think is the kind of the coolest about dplyr and that is the fact that it can have multiple backends. And you know this seems like a little bit of a 
kind of a weird, I don't know, talk title. But I think this idea of like separating specification from computation is such a powerful idea. And it's particular, I mean, you know, I'm gonna talk about in the context of uh, data transformation today, but also really, really powerful idea for modeling. So uh, other, other projects in, in our studio and elsewhere really build on this idea. So the tidy models framework, again, uses the same idea. You wanna specify that, you know, you want a linear model with, with these inputs and this output. And then you have a whole variety of engines to fit that, whether that's with, you know, a traditional LM from R itself or a, a faster alternative in another package, or with some, you know, slightly different approach, like using um, a Bayesian approach via Stan or similar. And then in, on the sort of machine learning side, we've had these packages like TensorFlow and Torch, which very much the same idea that you, your responsibility is to define the model you care about. And then these packages kind of abstract away how that's actually fit. So you care about what the, this kind of statistical side of it, and they care about making the code as performant as possible. And so today I'm gonna to talk about that in the context of dplyr, a package for data manipulation transformation, which I'll talk about shortly. And in particular, two backends, I'm gonna focus on dtplyr, uh, which translates into data table, very, very fast R package, and dbplyr, which translates your R code in SQL, so it can be run automatically in another in a relational database. Now, one thing I'm not gonna talk about too much today, but uh, thanks to a bunch of contributions from the community, many of the verbs in tidyr also have translations available. So you can do various types of pivoting and reshaping with data table or in SQL, again, using the same R code that you would write to work with an in the data frame. So the, the goal of dplyr really is to help, help you transform your data. And, to do that, there's 19 verbs, which sounds like a lot, and it is. I'll, I'll show you shortly that there's only you know, a smaller set that you'll need most of the time. But there's 19 key verbs. And I think the best way to think about these verbs is like, what do they operate on? We've got a set that operates on rows, like a range, which changes the order of the rows, or distinct filter and slice, which have various different ways of selecting the rows. So distinct just gives you the unique rows. Filter allows you to pick rows based on the values of variables and so on. We also got functions that work primarily on columns, this family of kind of uh, either selecting the variables you care about or renaming them or just moving them around. And then really importantly, the mutate function, which allows you to create new columns or new variables. Then we have two functions really about dealing with groups, the group by which groups your data and then summarize which collapse multiple rows or multiple rows in a single group down to a smaller succinct summary. So all of these verbs are really about working with a single table, but of course your data analysis is never gonna have just one data frame and you're often gonna have many, many, many data frames. And so dplyr also comes with a full set of these joins, left join, right join, inner join, full join, uh, semi join and anti join, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail later because these are a little less familiar to people, but I think really, really useful. And uh, then we've got a bunch of kind of set based ones if you want to in find the rows in common between two, table, two data frames and so on. So there's 19 verbs, like if you are, you know, if you're using dplyr every day, over time, you'll kind of um, probably learn most of them. You're not going to use all of them every day, but you'll hopefully remember the names of them. But I think there really are six verbs that are particularly important. So filter, which allows you to select rows based on the values of the variables. Mutate, which allows you to create new columns that are functions of existing columns. Group by and summarize to collapse your large data into something smaller and hopefully more informative and then left joins and semi joins. And so I'm gonna show them in action with a little demo uh, in our studio. So I'm gonna load a few packages. The data I'm gonna be showing you today is from the NYC flights 13 package, which contains a bunch of flights that departed from New York City in 2013. So here's an example of what dplyr code looks like. Um, if you uh, have never seen R code before, this is a little bit, probably the, the one thing that's a little bit mystifying is 
is this guy here, which is uh, the percent greater than percent, which is called the pipe operator and is most easily read as then. So this says, take the flights data set, then filter it to find all the destinations that are in uh, this set of possible values, which are the two airports in Houston, which is what I care about these days, since that's where I live. And so you can see when I run that, I'm gonna get a new table or a new data frame. This one in this case is uh, about 9,000 rows and 19 columns. So that's filter. It's picking out, I should have printed you the full, the full data set. The full data set is about 300,000 and I've narrowed it down to the 9,000 rows that are traveling to an airport in Houston. Uh, we could also create a new variable. So for example, in this data set, we've got the distance and in miles and the time in minutes that the flight lasted. So I could create a new variable called speed which is just the distance divided by the time. If I do that, however, um, while well, it's there, you can see it's kind of been printed out in the air, but I can't easily see it because I've got so many variables in this data set, they don't all fit on one screen. So I can use one of the other, um, one of the other functions called select. And here I'm just gonna say, these are the three variables that I care about right now, distance, air time, and speed. And you know, if you really wanted to, you could, uh, check my calculations there. But rather than doing that, rather than doing a um, calculation, I'm just gonna quickly spit that into a plot. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about visualizations today much at all. I'm just showing you this one. Uh, you can kind of see there's this interesting relationship between the distance a flight travels and its average speed, mostly because for very short flights, the speed that the, the, the flight is dominated by um, takeoff and landing, which obviously happen at much slower speeds. But I think that the, the point here though, is that dplyr is really designed as part of your overall data analysis, data science, pipeline, because when you're doing visualization, you're often going to want to do a little bit of data manipulation as well. Now that Bradley, is... can I in... Sorry, can I yes. interrupt? I think your screen has frozen. Hmm. We, we think it's frozen. <laughs> Let me, um, I'm just going to uh, restart Zoom and I'll be right back. So All right. Back. Okay. Okay, I am back. Welcome back. Mm. Oh, there and we go. Sharing oh. my screen again. Is it working this time? Yes. Okay. Great. Let me change my video camera. Okay. This is not the uh, the worst experience I ever had on a webinar. Is when my internet connection cut out uh, after ten minutes, and it took them like. 20 minutes to discover my phone number and call me. So I just gave a webinar to myself. <laughs> so, totally used to this. Okay, so I've created this new column called speed. Uh, if I just add that on the end, obviously I can't see that. Uh, and I've, you know, I've just used select so I can see those variables I just created. You can check my math if you want, or we can look at this plot just showing you know, again, the, the importance of like data transformation isn't a goal in and of itself. You're doing it because you, you're putting into a visualization or a model. So it's really, really important that all of these pieces fit together smoothly. So next, I'm just gonna quickly show some summaries. So, you know, one of the goals of DeepLyer is you can kind of read the sentence, read the code a bit like it's a sentence. So take the flights data, then group it by the dest, show up a destination. Then I'm gonna summarize it. I'm gonna compute the average delay, average arrival delay, and count the number of observations, the number of flights in each group, and then arrange it in terms of uh, increasing delay. So you can see that there's one airport that on average, uh, the flights arrive 22 minutes early, uh, but we can't really trust this average too much because there's only one data point there. So pretty common, probably wants to here, I'm just going to subset it, just going to filter it. So I'm only going to look at flights that have at least 365 entries. So at least, you know, one flight a day on average. And so now you can see the uh, best airports if you're flying from New York City, if you want to avoid delays, the best airport is SNA. 
And, you know, maybe you know what SNA is, I do not. Um, so probably at this point, you'd want to join in another data set. So I've got another data set here of airports that has the airport code, its name, location if I needed that, and uh, the time zone. And so what I could do if I want to get that data combined with this data is I can do a left join. So if I left join those two together, I can now get uh, the name of the airport, the average delay, the number of flights, and the name of the airport. So you can see John Wayne Airport in Orange County is a great place to fly to if you want to avoid delays on average. You can also see other places of Honolulu and Seattle. I, I think this is, a, I, I think, you know, one of the messages here is like the longer the flight, the more capability there is for them to make up time and um, the less delays on average. The other thing we can do here is we could say, well, let's just look at all of the destinations I have. Oh, I should say, I should actually should point out one thing here. The second airport, STT, when I do a left join, I get an NA here, a missing value. And that's because there was no matching airport in this airport's data frame that I have. So I have the, this airport code STT, but I don't have an entry for that in the airport's data frame that I have. And so you might wanna like ask that systematically, like what are all, what's all of the missing data? What are all the rows I have missing in airports that, that I do have in the flight data set? So I could start just by doing a quick count showing how many flights there were for each destination. And this is another thing I could do here is just do distinct, just to get a, a list of all of the unique airports. And then I can do an anti-join and an anti-join here is saying, give me all of the rows here that don't have a match in this data frame. And so you can see here four data frames that STT we saw earlier, but also BQN, SJU, and PSE which, you know, if you wanted to really do an analysis of this data, you'd want to go back and figure out, you know, where those airports were. Kind of the flip side of an anti-join is a semi-join. A semi-join just gives you the matching rows. Uh, one place where that's useful is I could say, well, give me the top 20 destinations by the number of flights. And now so this gives me the destinations, right? I've got these 20 destinations. Now I'd probably want to say, well, tell me about the flights to those destinations. And I can do that very easily by doing a semi-join. So this is going to give me all of the rows and the flights data that match a row in this top desk data frame. So that's going to give me all of the flights to one of those top 20 destinations. So semi-joins, anti-joins, a little less talked about a little less common than the kind of left join and right join and so on, but really, really useful when you've got multiple tables of data and you just want to see what matches. So just to confirm, we had 20 destinations and if I do a semi-join with flights, that corresponds to over 200,000 flights. So about two thirds of all of the flights in this data set went to those top 20 destinations. So that was a whirlwind tour of dplyr, the kind of the big picture. We've got these four types of verbs. Some of them work on rows, some of them work on columns, some of them work with groups, and some of them work with tables. Uh, designed to have hopefully memorable names. They're all kind of verbs because you know one of the things that's really important when you're coding is to be able to read that code aloud in your head so you and other people know what you're doing. That's dplyr, and there I was just working with a data frame, just a regular R data frame. Um, but at some point, you know, you're going to start to work with larger data sets. And I think there's kind of two signs that you might be working with kind of a big data problem. Uh, the first thing, the first sign that you might be working with big data is you spend more time computing the data than you do thinking about what to do. So when you've got small data sets, you can have this very fluid interaction where you kind of think of something you want to try with the data, type it in, and you get the result back instantly. And the bottleneck really is your brain, like the, you, the ability of you to come up with interesting questions to ask of the data. And so, but when your data starts to get larger, the computing, you know, your brain doesn't get any slower, but the computer does. So you might find that now the bottleneck is no longer what you're thinking, but what the computer has to do. 
Another sign you might be working with a, a large data set, or big data, is that just moving it around is a hassle. Like at some point, like some volume of data, you can't just easily, you know, stick it in an email or download it off our website. Now you've got to spend like hours uploading or downloading it. If you've got really large data, you're now thinking about like, how do I put all this data on a hard drive and like fly it somewhere? Because that's the fastest way of sending very large quantities of data still. So in either of these cases, uh, you know, you've got a lot of data and, you know, maybe it's more data than your memory, your computer has memory and you can no longer kind of fit everything. You can no longer just work with an ordinary article. Right? And that's where these kind of two, these, these back ends come in. The idea that the D player wants you to provide you the smooth transition from working with small in-memory data frames. That's what I've just shown you to working with uh, larger data sets that still fit in memory with the data table package. It's a really, really, really fast R package for working with data. Maybe you've got data that's too big to fit in memory. So now you maybe want to take kind of slices of that to work at a time or to do some computations in the database itself. Uh, or maybe the kind of the, you're just doing so much computation, you can't just rely on that one core on your computer anymore. You want to use all of the cores. Or maybe you've got like so much data now that just to, to compute with it, you want to spread it across multiple machines, in which case you might be using some distributed computation system like uh, Spark or um, Hadoop. So I kind of showed you working with a data frame in R. I'm going to talk a little bit more about working with a data table with DT plier package and with databases with a DB plier packages. I'll show you very, very briefly uh, how you can use multi D plier to use all of the cores on your computer. And I'm going to leave talking about Spark and Sparkly R for your, your own research. Okay, so DT plier. Um, the goal of DT plier is for you to write the same D plier code you're already using and to translate it to data table. Now there's some, a few kind of like philosophical differences uh, with, with data tables. So data table has kind of is designed around like incision and typing speed. There's one function that does all of the same thing those 19 verbs and dplyr does, uh, but it's designed to be really, really fast and to use as little memory as possible. And so kind of the goal of DTplyr is to sort of an experiment to see like, could we get the, the best of both worlds? Could we get the performance of data table without you having to learn any new syntax? If you already know DPlyr, could you benefit from data table immediately without having to learn anything else? And so the kind of goal here is that you're gonna keep writing DPlyr code and DTplyr is gonna write data table code for you. So what does this look like? So again, I have a little demo for you here. Uh, things proceed basically as before, but the first thing you need to do if you're gonna use dtplyr is you need to create this lazy dt object. And I'll kind of come back to more about why this is lazy later on, but basically when you do something, when you basically do something to this object and you use it with a dplyr verb, nothing happens immediately. It's gonna store up all of your operations so you can replay them at once. And the reason you wanna do that is because it gives kind of significant performance advantages because now DTplyr can look across multiple steps in your pipeline and say, oh, how can we like optimize this holistically rather than having to optimize it at a step at a time. So we've now got this thing that's just printed out. Uh, if you print it out, it looks exactly like uh, looks exactly like the, the table I was working with before, but you can now see it's called a local data table. And we'll see shortly that as we do stuff to this data table, it's gonna build up a data table call for us. So if I just rerun that code I showed you earlier, exactly the same results, but it's gonna build up this data table call for you. So data table uses the uh, square bracket subsetting operator extensively. And so if you wanna subset rows or filter rows with data table, you put that in a single argument call to uh, the, the square bracket. So certainly, you know, this is not super hard to learn. If you wanna learn, go ahead and learn data table. It's a great thing, great thing to know. Um, 
But the ability, the great thing about DDPly is you don't need to learn anything. You can, you don't need to learn anything right away. You can start by writing your existing DeepLy code and it gets translated into the equivalent data table code. So if you create a new variable, it's gonna get translated to use this uh, walrus operator, which is the colon and the equals. It's kind of, kind of, because it looks like a walrus, uh, which is also the reason that, uh, or one of the reasons that the data, well, this is a seal, not a walrus, but uh, close enough. So anything you can do in, in Dplyr, pretty much, uh, you can write the same code and DTplyr will translate that to the equivalent, um, the equivalent data table code. Now, you know, this is, this is automated translation, right? It's not as good as being like, you know, a fluent native speaker, but just like Google Translate, this is gonna get you a very long way for very little effort. And then as a useful, uh, ad, useful to do this side by side as you learn more about data table. Now, the thing I wanted to talk about a little bit more is this idea of laziness. Because when I run code like this, which if I was running, running it with a regular data table, it would group it and then immediately summarize it. If I run this code, nothing actually happens. It's just recording like this is the sequence of operations that you want to perform. And now if I print it, it's going to perform it. It, it does that just so you can see what the results are because that makes iterating with it much, much easier. Or you can just say, well, what is it going to do? What is the data table query that it's going to generate? Or finally, you can kind of force the computation um, to whatever you want, whether you want a table or a data, data frame, or you want to keep using a data table. And again, the reason we want to do this is because it allows us to optimize things. So in this case, uh, this simple, very, very simple case, but kind of illustrates it. We're going to filter to find all of the flights that go to uh, George Bush International. And then we're going to select these variables. Now, if I do these in steps, I'm kind of doing a bunch of work that I don't need to because I'm filtering every single variable. Like it's actually faster to select the variables and then do the filtering because there's kind of less work going on. But if I run this with DTplyr, you can see it generates a single call to data table and then data table can can select the columns and filter the rows simultaneously, which is faster than doing them one by one because you don't have to like select, you don't have to find all the data in the columns that you're not actually going to use. And this is the this is the reason that this sort of laziness is so important. You know, and this is a very simple case, but as your pipelines get longer, DTplyr gets more and more information about how to optimize that to create a more efficient final pipeline. Let me jump in with a question here. Mm -hmm. So the question is, um, it looks like DT1 is well hidden from the end user. It, it, it does not show up in the environment view. Is that an internal name? Is that something we should care about as users? Yeah, so that's something uh, you should basically not care about as a user. That's kind of all hidden behind uh, the details. It's just kind of a dummy name so you can see what the data table code looks like. You know, if I actually try and run that, it won't work because that object is kind of, I don't, I, I don't know if that object even exists or it's just created as it needed. Um, but, but yeah, basically you shouldn't worry about that. There are some cases where it will generate like multiple intermediate objects. Uh, I've forgotten what those cases are, but I spent a bunch of time recently trying to figure them out, but um, but yeah, just don't worry about that. That's just kind of a placeholder. So you can see what the translation looks like. Uh, but most of the time you'll rely on DTplyr to, to run that for you. And then just another quick one that came up a little bit earlier um, and it has to do with the joins. Why is left join preferred to full join? So the, the difference between the, the joins, a left join gives you all of the rows on the left-hand side and anything that matches on the right-hand side, full join, will give you all of the rows on the left-hand side and all of the rows on the right-hand side. Now, generally, like left joiners should be your kind of default. Like if you think about this case where I use the left join, like I had some summary data about flights 
I want to join on all of the airport data I have that matches that. It doesn't make sense to add in all of the airports that don't have flights going to them. Um, so most of the time, like, like left join is like your go-to join. Uh, inner joins, right joins, and full joins, you know, have their purposes, but they're relatively much, much less common. Thank you. And I should mention, I, well, we should, wants to see what, see what happens here. If you do a left join, airports, I have to try and remember the, on the right hand side, it's got destination, on the left hand side, it's got destination. Yeah, so this is a case where there's a, uh, there are two, two, two data tables in the mix, the flights data frame and the airports data frame. And so you can see there's a DT1 and a DT2 here. Uh, and as that gets more complicated, you know, there might be three or four and so on. But again, all of that's like hidden, that's a detail you shouldn't care about. So I'm, one of the big differences between data frames and data tables is that uh, data tables can kind of modify in place in a way that uh, data frames cannot. I I'm not gonna talk about that here. If you are a data table user and you want to learn DTPly, this is something you should care about. If you're a DPly user who's used to data frames and tibbles, this is something that DTPly just abstracts completely away from you so you don't need to worry about it. And then in general, um, this is not a very good benchmark, but just one little benchmark um, that shows that DT plier is much, well, in this case, it's three times, well, three-ish, two, three times faster than uh, regular D plier. Obviously in this case, you know, it's twice as fast, but it's saved 10 milliseconds. So, you know, that, I've spent more than 10 milliseconds trying to, to translate from one to the other, but uh, it just shows that there can be substantial performance improvements. And the interesting thing is there's obviously some overhead for translating uh, dplyr code to data table code, but that translation is proportional to the length of the pipeline. It's independent of the size of the data. So as your data gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and here I have a little example of um, 6 million observations at so 20 times bigger. Uh, I'm just going to load this in, which takes a few seconds. So as the size of the data set gets bigger, because that translation cost is proportional to the length of the pipeline, not the size of the, size of the data, the overhead of translation gets relatively smaller and smaller as your data gets bigger and bigger, which is you know, when you're going to care about this most. So if we run this on a um, larger data set, surprisingly, the difference is kind of uh, decreased here. I, I think this is a, just because this is a case where dplyr is like relatively strong, the place where data table is much better is when you have very, very large number of groups, it does that much more efficiently. So I'd expect to see a bigger, bigger difference there. So Hadley, another quick question. Um, mm -hmm. I usually teach across what I call the three ways of R, base, tidyverse, and data table. Are there any idiosyncrasies of using data table as a backend that I should, that would still be handled better in data table? Or do we pretty much do everything I mean, now with tidyverse? If you, if you want to teach, I mean, so yes, there are some idiosyncrasies and there always will be idiosyncrasies. But like over time, any like major idiosyncrasies that people identify, like we make them go away. So like over time, the set of idiosyncrasies is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, you know, they, 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 definitely, they definitely still exist. I would expect in kind of an intro course, you're unlikely to run into them, um, particularly in the latest version of DTPlyer, which has fixed a bunch of the, the, the things that kind of rose to the top amongst, amongst users. Uh, but I think that, that that question about idiosyncrasies uh, also comes up and even more so with, with dbplyr because, you know, dplyr uh, and data table are like very, very similar in, in many, many ways. Like they're all running inside of R. Things get a little bit more complicated when we move to dbplyr because we're now moving to like a fundamentally different kind of execution environment. We're now moving out of R and into a relational database, which is obviously profoundly different to R. 
And I think the thing that is sort of surprising and amazing to me about DB Playa is that it actually seems to work. Like despite R and SQL being so different, most of the things that you want to do, like most of the data manipulation things that you do in R, we can actually translate that to SQL. And that, that was honestly a su surprise to me. And I think one of the interesting things that came out of this work, that there is a fairly small set of data manipulation operations that you can translate to basically any language. So dbplyr, well, you know, if you are talking to a database in R, there's a sort of layer of packages you have to go through it. But generally what you're gonna do if you're talking to a database in R is you're gonna write SQL. Uh, so you're gonna write code like this, you are gonna use the DBI package, you're gonna to connect to a specific, you're gonna use a, a backend specific package, whether that's like to talk to Postgres or MySQL or Oracle or SQL Server, you'll use a slightly different package, but everything else looks the same. You create a connection and then you run some SQL query. So if you've used SQL before, you know, this is um, very, very simple SQL query. If you haven't before, you might notice that there are some like pretty profound similarities to dplyr. Like we're gonna select some columns from a data frame and then we're gonna filter it to find the rows where some condition is true. And so if I was to write this in dplyr, you know, it doesn't look that different. One of the, uh, I think one of the worst things about SQL though is that the, the, the kind of order in which you have to write it is a bit backwards. Like you declare the variables you want to extract before you declare the table you want to extract them from, which like never, I never really realized when I learned SQL, but when I kind of looked at dplyr versus SQL, I was like, oh, that is, well, that's kind of strange. You've got to say what, what I'm going to use before you say where I'm going to use. But that, you know, but that similarity is not a coincidence. Like dplyr was very much inspired by SQL and many of the verbs were heavily inspired by SQL. Um, so like a group, you know, if you want to compute a grouped mean in SQL looks a little bit different, but we've got that same kind of group by action going on there. So if you're, you know, if you're an R user already, you can learn SQL pretty quickly, but, like having to translate between R and SQL is surprisingly painful, not because they're so different, but because there's places where they're so similar, but there's just like one tiny little thing that is different that would trip you up every single time. For example, in R, you can use single quotes or double quotes around strings, but in most SQL dialects, you have to use single quotes. Or if you want to compute an average or a you know, in R we call that mean, but in SQL they call that AVG. If you want to raise a number to a power, you don't use caret, you've got to use this power function. And so there's a bunch of these like little annoying gotchas that just make switching between R and SQL pretty frustrating and kind of led to this question, like, can, can we automate this? And so the idea of dbplyr is that instead of you writing SQL, dbplyr will write SQL for you. Again, I'm just going to show you a little demo of that. Um, yeah, I'm just going to create a database, copy some data into it, uh, take a uh, one of the queries that I ran before, grouping, summarizing to count the number of rows, compute the average delay, and then I can say, just like uh, with dtplyr, show me what you're going to do with that and it has generated this SQL query. So it takes care of a bunch of annoying things for you in SQL. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this, but if you've ever had to, in SQL, if you want to like use a variable you just created and another expression, you're gonna wrap the whole thing inside a subquery, which is super annoying. Dplyr will take care of that for you. Uh, and it takes care of all these like little minor frustrations like in, you know, the way that logarithms work in R is subtly different to SQL uh, and it kind of translates these useful little R idioms for you. The other thing it takes care of is translating between all the different SQL dialects. And um, just one little case where the SQL dialects differ a lot is if you're pasting a variable together with a string. For example, in ANSI SQL, there's this function called concat ws and SQL lights, so you use two vertical bars. And Microsoft SQL Server, you use plus. 
in Microsoft Access, you use ampersand. There's like a bunch of these different variety, these different variants. And if you're using different databases, you're going to keep all of this in your head. And if you don't have to anymore, dbplyr will take care of translating that for you. So that's dtplyr, which translates uh, your large data sets to D D plier, sorry, to data table code. I, uh, I have to say the one thing I regret about this naming scheme is it is very easy to get confused between dplyr, ddplyr, dbplyr, and others. So dtplyr translates your dplyr code to data table. dbplyr translates your dplyr code to SQL. Multi dplyr doesn't do any translation really. All it does is it splits your data set up across multiple R processes. And that means you've got multiple R processes that can be doing the same thing at the same time using different cores on your computer. Again, no difference in the syntax, except that you're gonna use this new verb called partition. You create this little cluster, this cluster. This is just multiple, you know, very, very primitive computing cluster. It's just using cores on your computer. Uh, you create a little cluster and then you can petition your data. You can spread your data across all of those cores. So when you do any computation on that, it's going to use all of the computing power available to you on your machine, not just a single core, which is ours default. So just to, that was a real whirlwind tour of the dplyr and dplyr backends, um, but really useful if I think you have a big data problem, the two Kind of warning signs that you might have a big data problem is now the bottleneck isn't you, it's the computer. You spend a little bit of time thinking and then it takes ages for the computer to go away and do what you actually want. Or just moving the size of data around as a hassle. And instead of bringing all of the data to you for computation, you might want to send some of the computation to wherever the data lives, which is very much the idea of dbplyr, where you're sending the computation to happen in that relational database or in Sparkly R where you're now sending that computation to happen on that big, big cluster, big real cluster of computers that your institution has set up for you. And really the goal here with dplyr is to provide the smooth and gradual transition. You learn dplyr, you use it most of the time on, on just regular in-memory R data frames, but as your needs get bigger, dplyr scales with you, dtplyr for large in-memory data sets, dbplyr, for uh, data that lives in out of memory data that lives in databases, multi dplyr when you've got a lot of computation, we use all of the cores on your computer, and then Sparkly R for that that big real cluster of machines. Thank you. Well, Hadley, we've got some questions, so thank you very much. But we do have some questions. Um, one is does uh, does multiplier work for mapping in parallel, or do you recommend fur or another package? Oh, uh, that is a good question. I think if you know what the fur package is and you understand functional programming, you probably sh should use it. You are probably not the target audience for multi dplyr. Um, otherwise, you know, if you just want to do the most easy, if you're an existing dplyr user and you just want to do utterly painless multi core parallelism, like multi dplyr is a tool for you. Thanks. And we have a sort of forward looking question. Um, and it is, I, I can see this idea of separating specification from computation in the future of notebook based data science, specifically allowing each code chunk to use its own compute environment. One code chunk uses could use GPUs, another multiple CPUs, etc. And eventually the notebook will be smart enough to determine the optimal resource for each code chunk. How far away from something like this, are we? Is our studio moving in this direction? I, that, that is, yeah, that, when I started sort of working on this, that, that was kind of my dream too, that you would just write this code and it would figure out like how to allocate data across, you know, multiple cores or multiple machines or whatever. Uh, I think that turns out to be a surprisingly difficult problem and not something that, you know, I think is going to happen seamlessly in the next five or even 10 years, just because so much of how you organize the data, if you are not like organizing the data, the right way to organize your data depends so critically on the questions you want to ask of it. And you 
kind of don't know that until the end and you don't necessarily even know what questions you're going to ask until you've asked the wrong questions. Uh, so I think automating that is just really, really tough. And I have basically given up on that and instead are working on tools so that if you know, you know, it makes sense to, I mean, this is kind of, this is kind of the idea of multi dplyr Like if you, if you know you're going to analyze by destination, you group it before you cluster it so that you can keep all of the destinations together on one cluster. Just trying to do that automatically was, I gave up, it was too hard. So another question is, does dbplyr handle indices on the database side? Yeah, so dbplyr knows nothing about indices. It just passes, it just generates the query. And the assumption is that it's gonna generate like a reasonable SQL and then the database query planner will take that SQL and generate the optimal kind of query plan that uses all the indexes. Uh, you can, like if you are using dbplyr to kind of put data in your database or create temporary tables, you can set indexes yourself. But I've basically said that's out of scope for dbplyr. You're gonna have to learn about how your specific database works with indices so that you know what to, not, what to do there. Then how about, do we have a tidy way to do conditional joins. For example, airport to airport renovation where flight date gets renovation date. So I think this is probably a question from the um, kind of data table side, which has a very, um, which is kind of one of the, 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 the things you can express very elegantly in the data table code. There is currently no, a uh, way to kind of elegantly express that idea in uh, deep layer code in a way that will get reliably optimized to something fast. Um, I don't know if there's like a good reason that doesn't exist today or just it's a problem that I don't experience very much and so I've not been incentivized <laughs> to fix. Uh, but it also fe it feels like weird to me to introduce a new verb for that specific case. So I, I think I'm basically kind of keep kicking the can down the road in the hope that in the future you would just write the condition. You would, you know, do the join and then write the condition and then some magic thing makes that fast for you. So that's kind of my uh, hope and dream for right now. So Hadley, I have a question for you. So we've seen such a transition in statistical computing over the decades. You've been involved in very much of this. And now we have the field of data science that's been taking off for almost a decade, I guess. Um, when we look at kind of where all this is going across disciplines, across methodologies that are being developed, and you sort of kind of look through your crystal ball, I mean, where is all of this going? I, I mean, I, I have no idea. Um, I, I think history teaches us like this is where I'd make a pronouncement like the world has a need for four mainframes total and, you know discover that's completely wrong um you know I, I think the thing that like is clear that like if you use data to make decisions you make better decisions than without data and that is true for like pretty much whatever field of endeavor you are in and we are you know even though data science is in, you know credit has grown massively we are still only just kind of scratching the surface of where we could be using data to make better decisions. So I think that like just, you know, data science in general, statistics in general is gonna just keep, keep growing because people now are really getting clued into this, this idea. And then I think the other thing that is around to stay is just like programming as a way to express what you wanna do with data. Obviously like some pretty kind of steep learning costs to get started in the programming language but it just gives you this you know, profound power and flexibility to express what you want. And that is so important, I think, for data science because there are like relatively few kind of canned solutions that you want to apply. For every problem, you want to bring in your, your understanding of the domain, your understanding of the data to create some solution, you know, to, to understand what's going on. And every analysis is a little bit different and really important to have the the flexibility of a programming language there. Yeah. Well, along, along with that, and thinking in terms of flexibility of program languages, uh, another question that just came in is that many data science teams work in R and Python and maybe other languages. 
you know, what is the state of the art workflow for managing multi language data science pipelines? Yeah, so one um, kind of coming back to this specific separating specification from computation. I think another really interesting project is uh, Apache Arrow, which is about designing kind of a data structure for, for data science data frames that works the same way across every programming language. And so the vision of um, Apache Arrow is that you can kind of store your data in one way, like whether it's on disk or in memory, and then use that from whatever programming language you like without having to translate between the different languages. So I, I think like, you know, Arrow is like, it's pretty solid now. I think, it, you, you know, you can use it, it's really useful, but not enough people know about it. And I think this is gonna be a really important kind of tool for cross language collaboration because you don't have to care about like, oh, you know, if I'm in Python, I wanna like pickle my data. If I'm in R, I want to save it to an RDS, and that's great if you're only in those systems, but it makes it hard to communicate. In the future, you'll just stick it in an arrow file, read it from Python, from R, from JavaScript, you know, from whatever language comes around in the future. Just make that, just completely eliminate some of that, that pain of working between languages. Thank you. Well, listen, Hadley, we know that you've got a hard stop coming up, and we really greatly appreciate the time here. Um, Hold on a second. We had one more quick little question. Uh, what DPLR functions are currently not supported by DTPlyr? Can you mix and match DTPlyr code with non-supported DPLyr helper functions, like starts with? Uh, I think every DPLyr function is supported by. I mean, every every DPLyr function I know about is supported, which. And I do not any longer know about all of the deep life functions, but I, the translation is pretty complete. And there's a couple of folks on the community have been really, uh, really charging ahead and contributing translations from tidy R. So that that's all pretty solid. And this kind of mix of tidy select operators like starts with and ends with that just works seamlessly in DT Plyer as well. Okay, thank you. Well, have a great talk. We're gonna all give you an applause that you won't get to hear, but uh, <laughs> thank you so much for spending time with us. And we look forward to doing this again when we can actually do something in person um, and hope you've enjoyed our forum. Yeah, thanks and so much for audience, having me. Audience, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. <laughs>